uh, who have talked about uh, um, what has been ordered tell us about the kind of policy to promote them. Okay, so hi everybody. So first of all, I'd like to thank Maya and John Philip for organizing this and inviting me. And so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a joint work with Pavel Mardesic, Kuran Radunovic, and Maya Resman. So what's, what's the, the basic situation is, let's, let's have a germ of analytic diffeomorphism in a complex plane that's tangent to identity up to some order k plus one. And let A be um, an, an orbit of some point x zero by iteration by this diffeomorphism. So it can be any orbit. All that we ask is that it accumulates towards zero. And so the basic question is, what does such orbit tell us about the chairman? Well, the, the answer is trivial. It, the, it determines, knowing the set, set A, determines the value of F on A, because it just sends one point to the next one. And so there's, there's at most one analytic function that can have such, such values. So one could want to just stop there, but, but we, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So the question is, how does this work? So what, what we have here is basically a problem. How, how does one continue this function f from, from A to a neighborhood of an origin in a complex plane? And other with weaker, weaker version, can we determine the analytic invariance of the term F, so an invariance with respect to conjugation in the group of diffeomorphisms. In, in terms of, of the conformal class of, of the term of Z that I have. So there, there, so another way to rephrase this problem, so it's in terms of fractal analysis of, of the set A. So, so suppose now that the, the orbit is real, real positive, okay? So the, the basic object to consider, one can consider is what's called the Q function. So the Q function measures the Lebesgue measure of an epsilon neighborhood of, of the orbit. So for example, if one looks at the um, leading asymptotic term, then this, this coefficient p in the power, that's what's called the Minkowski dimension or box dimension. And the constant would be the Minkowski content of the orbit. And another object that's naturally associated to it is the fractal chain. So in this case, it's just the um, half of the distances of two consecutive points. And one can rephrase it also as the, as the half of the minimal gap between the points of a partial orbit. And, and a third object that we have is a counting function. So we just counted the number of the elements in this fractal chains that are bigger than given epsilon. And so an, an easy, easy lemma is that um, the two function is just the, twice the integral of the counting function. And so this, this means that all these three fractal objects, they carry exactly the same information as, as the initial orbit. So one can, one can study either of these things. And so that's, that there's a series of articles by Maya Resman and her collaborators that study the two function and other things. And so this work is continuation in this program. 
So let, let, let me let me now recall the, the theory of analytic classification of parabolic channels. So this this was achieved independently in the works of Birkhoff, Eckhart, and Voronin. And so I'll, I'll follow the, the Eckhart, Eckhart version, but kind of um, without going into the resurgent analysis. And so the, 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 the first thing to do is to, what tries to construct FA2 coordinate. So FA2 coordinate conjugates the dynamics to a translation by one, so it straightens the dynamics. And one can, one can construct such FA2 coordinate formally. So for example, um, after some pre-normalization that one can always do, it will take this kind of form. So Tx will denote the, the initial term of the Fatu coordinate. And um, the, the issue is that this, this power series is in general divergent. So the next step comes the Borel summation process. So what one does, one apply the Borel transformation, or inverse Laplace transformation. So that's this sort of integral Fourier type transformation. So here one integrates over, um, over some line. And so one applies these things term-wise to this formal series. There's a, there's a little issue that when one applies it to these initial terms, it's actually a divergent integral. So there's a little bit of creative interpretation that goes there to interpret, for example, the Borel transform of a constant as a, as a Dirac distribution or the Borel transform of the initial term as a, as a derivative of the Dirac. But the, the important thing is what happens with the power series. So now it becomes a power series in one over K. And this power series actually becomes convergent. So this defines a function and so to get a big psi is some sort of distribution that's k times ramified to zero. And then the next step is one applies a Laplace transform to this capital Psi. And uh, one obtains now a sectorial Fatu coordinate. Well, it's not, it's not obvious why this should work, but it works perfectly. And so one, one really gets a Fatu coordinate sector. And um, one can change the direction in the integration on this k time k sheeted surface. Uh, and so one. one Mart Martin? Uh, yes. Do you, do you hear me? May, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, in your, your formula of uh, Laplace, uh, yes. what is alpha? So alpha, so alpha is the direction over which one integrates. So one here, okay. one okay. integrates. Over there. Alpha, okay, alpha is not de determined in advance. When you pick any alpha and you try to integrate along this. Uh, direction. Yes. Yes. And do you claim that this integral exists or? Uh, yes, I, I will. I will get to it. So, okay. it okay. it it does exist for for every non-vertical direction. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so, as as long as the direction varies smoothly, then then it's the same same function of analytic continuation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, so so to now to, to complicate things a little bit, there is a second version, a different version of, of this Borel summation process. And so I so 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 here we we first apply the Borel transform, which is by integrating over a whole line. 
And so the, this line can be also deferred into a Hunter contour. And then one integrates over, over a ray. So one can switch that. One can start by integrating over a ray and then finish by integrating over a Hunter contour that encircles a ray. And this works equally well and it defines and it gives, defines exactly the same what you coordinate. But now it's got one big advantage. And the advantage is that now this termwise integral be becomes absolutely convergent. And so it defines a function. So there's no, no Dirac's, no need to interpret anything. And in fact, one can, one can relate this, this new Borel transform with the, with the old one. So let's say if the old, the old, the distribution Borel transform left on the ray EI alpha R positive, then this new, new psi tilt lives on the complement of this ray in the complex plane. And so it's, um, it's, it's multi-valued. It's got a ramification over this ray. And so if one takes the difference of the two values in a distributional sense, one gets exactly this, this psi. So anyways, it doesn't for, for both this psi or psi tilt. One has, has a theorem by Ical that says that these things are resurgent. And what, what it means is that they are infinitely analytically continuable. So on the, on the complex plane minus two pi i z. And they have an at most exponential growth in all non-vertical direction on all sheets. And so this means that one can, that this Laplace transform always defines a function for, for every non-vertical direction. Okay, so this is the picture. So we have, we have a covering of origin by number of these sectors. On each sector, we have a plot to coordinate. So there's exactly 2K of sectors. And so whenever one is on this, on this pink intersection, one can compare the two for two coordinates. And so one composes the coordinate on the, on the right and on the left. And so one gets a transition map, which by, um, by construction has to commute this translation by one. And so it takes the form identity plus a Fourier series. And the Fourier series is always contains only the exponential of exponential powers of either two pi i t or minus two pi i t. And so the, the classification goes that um, two such terms tangent to identity are analytically equivalent if and only if they have same formula invariant and the same collection of these transition maps, modulo and action of C, and the action of C is just by conjugation, by translation. So it corresponds to, um, one can always add a constant to a FATU coordinate and get, again, a FATU coordinate. And then um, the second half of the theorem says that all such formal invariants and analytic invariants are realized. And so one has a complete description of the moduli space. So now let, let us look at what, what the, so, so, this, so we have these coefficients A omega, which, which are, are analytic invariants. So let, let's look what's the meaning of these coefficients. So this is just the um, formula of the transition map. So now I can rewrite it in, um, 
additive way. So one can look at the difference of the two for two coordinates on the left and right. And so by, uh, by, by this Borel Laplace equation, this is just an integral over this kind of Henkel contour of, of, this, of this big psi. And so now one can further this contour into an infinite sum of contours like this. And then, then in fact, the, the equality between the two infinite sums becomes termwise. So one has that is e, a omega times e omega psi is equal to the integral of psi over the corresponding one and to contour. And now what 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 is what does this identity mean? So uh, let for simplicity, let's suppose that there's no logarithmic term in the coordinate. So then in that case, the identity means if one looks at the at the singularity of the distribution of psi at some point omega and a multiple of two pi i, then um, then the leading leading term of of the function is is just a simple pole, and the coefficients at the simple pole is precisely this invariant a omega. I mean, not precisely, it's up to some multiplicative factor, but this multiplicative factor comes from this constant. And so in the end, it becomes quotient up. So for example, so let, let's, let's suppose that, that this, this psi is initially defined somewhere in the, in the right half plane. So to get the coefficients on, on this first upward and the singularities in this first upward directions, one just continues the function psi toward the singularities. Now to get the, the next, next upward singularities, one has to continue the function psi to the to the next to its next sheet. So one has to go go around zero once and then go to, to the singularity. And then one, the next time one goes twice around zero, etc. And the same thing for the for, for the singularities on the downward directions. And so this this way one one can sort of read all this all this coefficient. Okay, so let's let's leave it there. So let's 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 come back now to our problem. So we have we have this orbit A. Now, if we regard it as a as a sequence of point, it's got some asymptotic behavior, and so it's it's this asymptotic behavior that that contains uh, information about the original general. and so we want to somehow get information out of this asymptotics. So we define what we call a dynamical theta function of the orbit. So we define it as a sum of these exponentials at the point of the orbit. And so the, the way Ex is the same one as, as before. And so one can think of it as sort of a discrete version of this Borel transform. And so in fact, it, that's precisely what it is. It's the, it's the Borel transform, the second one, when applied to the sum of the, uh, to a formal sum of the Dirac's at, at the point of the orbit. So that's one way to look at it. Now there, there's a, so what, what our, our motivation for this, 
for this de de definition comes from what's called fractal zeta function, something studied in fractal analysis. And so fractal zeta function is basically a discrete version of Mellin transfer. And so, so in the typical object in fractal analysis are some sets that have some sort of self-similarity with respect to scaling. And obviously the, log the logarithmic function is something that changes linear scaling into a translation. And so that's a, that's a definition that's, that works well for, um, for fractal analysis. So we modified it to work for, for dynamics. And another motivation comes from a work of Voros who introduced it's called a spectral theta function. And so this definition of spectral theta function is again, a some sort of sum of exponentials, but in that case, not a, a sum over, um, over a spectrum of some operator. For example, a Laplacian with some border condition. So that's where our naming comes. Okay, so here's a here's a first theorem. So the so this function theta, it's initially defined on the positive half plane, and from there it can be continued analytically to the whole covering surface of C minus two pi i z. And again, it has at most exponential growth in all non-vertical direction. So exactly as we've seen for the Borel transfer of Fatou. So this is, this is kind of our, here's our main theorem. So here in this picture, so here we are on the right hand, we have a function theta a defined initially on the right half plane. And then there's, a, there's some singularities at two pi i z and there's potential ramification at all these singularities. And so one can look what happens if one integrates over a, a contour that a Henkel contour that goes around one of these ramification cuts. So if we integrate the theta divided by two pi i s times this uh, La Laplacian kernel. So what we get, so if we go around zero, we get exactly the uniquely determined sectorial Fatou coordinate that's, that lives on the sector that contains the orbit. And that's normalized so that it equals zero at, at the first point at the orbit. And now if one does that over, um, over some other of these contours, then one get an one over omega, some exponential of omega. Fatu coordinate. So, so, so we have some, we have basically some kind of a genometric version of Borel summation. So, in the in the classical story, one starts from a formal Fatu coordinate, applies a Borel transform, and then place Laplace transform over Hankel contour and gets the sectorial Fatou. So we, we do kind of the same thing, but we, we apply it based to, not to a formal series, but to an orbit. And we, we recover the Fatou. So the first color, if, if we, if we recover Fatou, then of course we recover also 
the, the diffeomorphism f from the from the part two relation. Uh, a second corollary, we can now we, we can also read the the, the Ekalvoronin invariance directly from this function theta. So as before, let's say for simplicity, suppose that there's no, no log, log term. So in that case, if the leading terms at each singularity is just a simple pole, and so when one looks at the coefficients of the pole, and so so what one does, one now looks, one has to look at the coefficient, let's say at the first sheet, and then at the second sheet. And so if one does, if one takes the difference, the second sheet minus the first sheet, one gets the, one gets the, the Calvernian invariance on the, on the, on the first upward direction. Then one goes, let's say the third sheet minus the second sheet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, up to up to k times. And this one, this way, one one can recover all these Ekalvoronin variants. So, okay. So how much time? So I have still a bit of time. So. Maybe I can give you a sketch, sketch of proof of theorem. So, so this this um, this sector of fat two coordinate that we talk about, it's it's got the by by its definition, it's got the properties that it sends the end for point of the orbit to to the integer n, and so. If if you look at this function one over two pi i, this fat two coordinate minus one, this function has a simple poles exactly at the points of of the orbit. So so now if one integrates this this thing over this contour, so this is a picture in the coordinate psi a, then just by um, residue theorem. That's exactly our function theta a. So now we can divide this contour into two halves. So in the part that's in the upper plane and in the part that's in the lower plane, we can expand this kernel. So in the in the upper plane, we expand it as into powers of e to pi i psi a. In the lower plane, one expands it into the powers of e minus two pi i psi a. And so one, when one puts it together, one gets all, all, the, all the integer powers of two pi i psi. And so one gets this infinite sum of these integrals. And uh, okay, each of these integrals is Nothing else than the Borel transform of of this thing, so of the exponential times the derivative. Well, and now now the the main observation is that um, that the singularity, the ramification point, that that's at some point omega. In this picture, this this kind of one takes looks at this one ramification. Then that ramification comes only from this one term in the infinite sum. So all the, all the rest doesn't produce any ramification at that point. And so if one that means that the, now the Laplace integral over that contour of of the function theta is the same as basically the inverse of this Borel transform. So it becomes this. 
and then and then the then this relation is just rewriting of of this. Okay, so um, to finish, so let's let's now look at one can also follow the fractal point of view. So supposing now that the orbit is um, real, very positive, so we have this um, fractal chain, just which are just the half of the distances of two consecutive points. And you have the counting function. So let the note tau epsilon, the, the leading asymptotic term of this counting function. So we can now define, define what we call a fractal theta function of the orbit. So we take now sum of over this fractal chain of ES tau epsilon. And that can be expressed also in an integral form as an integral of the counting function. And the, the claim is that, in fact, this new, so this, this fractal theta function is exactly the same as, a, as the dynamical theta function, but of, of some orbit a tilt, which is analytically conjugated to the original one, which is analytic image of original orbit for some analytic diffeomorphism. And so um, it's an orbit of some analytically conjugated germ, and therefore it's got the same analytic invariance. And therefore one can also read the analytic invariance straight from this fractal theta function. Okay, and that's, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh